Church, good to see you guys. We're going to have some fun this morning. We're going to worship Jesus. Yeah, put your hands together. Get your voices. Here we go. One bring it to the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of all. seated just for a couple of minutes. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Michael, and I want to welcome each and every one of you to our services today, and a special, special welcome to all of our first-time guests in the house. Come on, can you give them a hand today? Guys, if you are new to Merge, we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. One of the ways that we do that is through the Connect card. You'll see it on the seat back in front of you. It's the 
green card right on the seat back in front of you. If you will take just a minute, fill that out, just place it in the generosity box right outside the door, man. We just want to have a time just to recognize your visit with us today. So if you will take some time to do that. Also, if you will, everyone in the house, pull out your phone right now. Go to our Facebook page, and I want you to share this live feed with others because we want your friends and your family members to be a part of this service with us. So take some time to do that right now. Hey, we've got one announcement this morning. We have youth tonight at the church from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And so if you are in 6th grade through 12th grade, we invite you to join us. If you've never been before, come see me right after service. I would love the opportunity to meet you and just let you know about our youth ministry. But come on out and join us this evening. Guys, go ahead and stand back up to your feet. And we're going to get ready for some worship today. Are you ready today? Come on. Come on now. We're going to bring some worship to the Lord today because he's worthy of our praise this morning. Hey, one of the ways that we worship is through our giving. And so if you came prepared to give, you can give in the generosity box right outside the doors. You can give online at merge.church. You can text to give or whatever way that you choose. Guys, thank you so much. Man, God is doing so much in and through this church. And I'm so excited about what's ahead. I mean, you're a part of that through your giving. So thank you for partnering with us. Guys, let's worship today. Come on, let's just make up in our minds. God, I'm going to give you my best. I'm not going to hold back. I'm not going to let my tiredness or my worries about tomorrow or my regrets about yesterday keep me from worshiping you because, God, you're worthy today. Come on, can we agree with that right now? He's worthy this morning. God, we love you today. God, we love you. We thank you. God, we've got so much to be thankful for, and so we give you thanks for who you are and for what you've done. We thank you for your blessings, God. We thank you, Lord, that you've never left us. You've never forsaken us, God. Thank you for your provisions, God. Thank you for your presence, God. Your presence that makes all the difference in our lives. I pray that you would have your way in this service today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Cause this is how I find my back Come on Oh, this is how I find my Come on, this is how we declare our faith over this generation Over this world, over this city This is how we find Our worship is our warfare This is how I find my back This is how I find my back Worship. Man, if it's your first time here, my name is Jacob. We say a special welcome to you. If you're joining us online, we say welcome. It's such an honor to have you in the house for Rock and Roll Sunday at Merge Church. <laughs> we're in this series called Holy, and we're looking at individuals in Scripture that had encounters with our holy God. And why would we care about God's holiness? We care about God's holiness because we care about the character of God. If you want to know someone, you have to get to know their character and their characteristics. And the primary foundational characteristic of God is holiness. If you ask most believers, they would tell you that it's God's love. And we value God's love and his grace and his mercy. But all of those things flow from the holiness of God. Because he is perfectly holy, he is perfect love and justice and mercy and grace and peace and joy and all of the things that you and I desire. So we kicked off this series looking in Isaiah chapter 6. And what is a really strange passage within scripture. It's Isaiah prophet having a vision and it talks about seraphim which are just these angelic beings. Most scholars would tell you they're actually a statue representative of kind of eastern culture within this temple setting at the time and it's wings and it's eyes and it's all of this seemingly strange stuff that is actually very foundational and fundamental to our faith because we see the seraphim both in Isaiah and in Revelation which is the very end of scripture refer to God as holy, 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 thrice holy, the God who was and is and is to come, meaning our God is everlasting and so is his holiness. And when Isaiah has this encounter with God, it leads him to humility and confession. And the beauty of our God is that when we humble ourselves before him and we confess to him, he moves us from woe is me, as Isaiah refers to himself, to here I am, send me. And then last week we looked at a story that probably connects with me more than Isaiah's vision. We, we looked at a guy that had some insecurities and some doubt and some inabilities. He was older in age and working for his father-in-law, and he has an encounter with God up on a mountaintop, and God speaks to him through a, a burning bush. And God refers to this ground as holy ground. Now, we talked last week about how there is no pre-existing holy ground. See, it was God's presence that made the ground holy because God is holy. Therefore, where God is becomes holy. And you and I, through the power 
and the impartment of the Holy Spirit on our lives as believers now carry with us the presence of God Almighty. So the places that we go, we claim as holy ground. But I love this story that we talked about last week because it starts with here I am, not here I am, send me. And man, I think about Isaiah and he just moves straight from, you know, woe is me to here I am, send me. Most of our journeys have some pause buttons on them. They're more like, ah, here I am. I'll get to the send me part later, and that's okay. Because we all have a unique spiritual journey that we're going on. Do I have any wrestling fans in the house? I said it wrong, so you didn't understand what I meant. Do I have any wrestling fans in the house? (laughs) Wrestling, you know? I remember being a young kid. I was in first, second grade, and I signed up for this baseball team. And the coach, he sits us down, and he lets us choose our team name. Terrible idea. Pretty sure he was one of these volunteer coaches that didn't have any of his own kids, or he wouldn't have made such a foolish mistake. We voted to name our team the Ultimate Warriors. And we went sub-500. There's something unique about wrestling, and when you really think about it, and some of you are like, I've never thought about the uniqueness of wrestling. Well, think about it today. It isn't the acrobatics, and it isn't, you know, the the larger-than-life guys or gals that are doing it. The, The thing that makes wrestling popular and known and followed is the storytelling. It's the writing. See, the part that many people don't understand is that within the wrestling industry, they actually employ countless writers, just like a good TV show. People that write great books and they write sitcoms write these scripts because it's in the story of the wrestling that people fall in love. And the more you know about the storyline, the more enthralled you become with the wrestling that's actually going on. And today we're going to look at a third encounter that someone had in the Old Testament with our holy God. And it was a wrestling match between a guy by the name of Jacob and what we're going to see referred to in Scripture as a man. But when you break it down theologically, Jacob is wrestling with one of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to tell you which one, but he's wrestling with God. Now, I want to give you a little bit of backdrop because the story matters. The storyline matters. So Jacob is born of Isaac and Rebekah. But it's important that we understand that Rebekah was barren. She couldn't get pregnant. And so Jacob comes along a little bit later in life, and he is actually by divine appointment. I, I, his father is like praying for him and believing for him. And then Rebekah gets pregnant with twins. And she's actually communicating at one point in scripture about how these two twins won't stop wrestling within her womb. And she's kind of asking God, like, what are you doing to me? Now, I've never been pregnant, but I have lived with a spouse that has been pregnant three times. And I can tell you that when the babies are rolling in the stomach, it seems like a really miserable experience. As thankful as you are for the life that dwells within you, it's very uncomfortable. So she has Jacob and Esau in her womb, and they're wrestling. They're fighting with one another. Jacob has been a wrestler since the very beginning of his inception. (laughs) Then we see in Scripture that Jacob is born, and Esau is coming out of the womb first. And Jacob is grasping at his heel because Jacob's want to be first. Let's get one thing right. Jacobs are winners. That's right. My wife's going to watch that back, and then she's going to tell me that was unacceptable that I said that. (laughs) Jacob has this built within him, so much so that as he's growing up, he becomes pretty disgruntled. So he wrestles in the womb, and he tries to be firstborn. But his brother Esau comes out looking like a woolly mammoth, and he's a total man's man. And he's a hunter. He's all of the things that his father hoped for. He has a very special relationship. And Jacob, by all accounts, would have been somewhat jealous of the relationship that Esau had with their father. 
And so later on in life, Esau, he, he gets married, he's doing all the things, and Jacob's just kind of the dude hanging out in his mom's basement, you know, trying to figure life out a little bit. But he devises this really unique plan. He goes, you know what? I want to be the firstborn. I've always wanted to be the firstborn, and I want to receive my father's inheritance, which is exclusively limited to the firstborn. So one day Esau has been out hunting, and he's tired, and he's famished, and he comes in, and Jacob says, ah, I'll give you this bowl of soup that looks so fantastic and delicious, but in exchange for it, Esau, I want your birthright. I want the thing that you should value the most. And in exchange, I'll give you a bowl of soup. And Esau falls for this trick, and he takes the bowl of soup. And so Jacob goes on to lie to his father to claim that he is Esau to receive the blessing of the firstborn from his dying and blind father. And my parents named me after this guy. This is the backdrop of the story of Jacob. So he then leaves home and he gets married. He's got a couple wives. We'll skip over that part, talk about that another day. And then he realizes one day that he wants to return home. And so he's on this journey back home where we're going to pick up in the story, in the wrestling match of the life of Jacob. It's in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 32. It says, that night. Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, Let me go, for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun arose above him, and he passed Penel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites did not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. That's a long passage. We're going to break it down. But is this not the most awkward wrestling match in history? Could you imagine being in a physical wrestling match with someone that you don't know for hours on end? Like you're just wrestling with this random person while you're all alone and all you want to do is get back home. We're going to break down this story because in this story I believe there are some great takeaways for you and me that will allow us to have an encounter with a holy God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And God, I pray that you would speak through it. I pray that you would use me to be your vessel, that I would simply be a conduit through which you flow. I pray that we would have open hearts and open minds to receive the fullness and the power of your spoken word in this place. And that we would leave this building transformed, ready to be your hands and feet ready to be your witnesses to this lost and dying world. We pray all of these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said. It said this. That night Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled him till daybreak. Now to set the scene a little bit further, Jacob decides that he wants to go back home and make amends with Esau. His brother, with whom he's wrestled with from the very beginning of time, but now they have zero relationship because Jacob stole from Esau that which was most valuable to Esau, his birthright. And so Jacob sends word to Esau, like, hey, bro, I'm coming home. Like, let's make amends. You know what I'm saying? And Esau's like, hey, great idea. Me and 400 of my closest friends will come meet you. (laughs) 
AKA Jacob's got some problems. He realizes that when Esau doesn't say, yeah, man, I'll come and meet you. And Esau's like, yeah, me and 400 of my closest friends will come. That there is a massive problem going on. So Jacob begins the night dreading Esau's arrival. And he splits up his camp and he sends people in different directions so that if Esau and his 400 whoop one of them, there'll still be something of Jacob's lineage, something of his group, something of his following. And then Jacob separates himself so that he can have some alone time to deal with the anxieties and the frustrations and the struggles of the fact that his plan is not going the way he wants it to. Did anyone come in the room looking up going, you know what? The plan that I had for my life is going exactly the way I thought it would. That's not how life works. Trust me. I didn't think that in 2022, this is where I would be standing. I had a different plan for my life. So Jacob's struggling with the fact that the plan doesn't seem like it's going right. And so he begins to wrestle with this man. He begins to wrestle with God. Can I tell you this? Struggling with God in faith leads to peace. You're like, what, what do conflict and peace have to do with one another? Now, I'm notorious for being willing to beat a dead horse. I will think through something 17 different directions. I will plan and plot and calculate. I will wrestle with it and wrestle with it and wrestle with it and wrestle with it. I'll seek input and guidance. I'll pray. I'll read the word. I'll go back. I'll do it all over again, over and over and over to the point that people think I'm crazy. And I am a little. But in all of the wrestling, in all of the struggling, what happens is I get myself to a place where I can make a decision with peace. Now notice I didn't say I could get myself to a place where I can make the right decision. I don't know if it's the right decision. All I know is that I made the decision with peace. Peace, why? Because I was willing to wrestle. I was willing to struggle with God, with his divine plan and say, what is it that you really have for me? What direction do you want me to go? What's the answer to the problem? Could I get it in multiple choice so I got a chance at getting it right? And so many of us get to this place in our faith journey where we become frustrated and the plan isn't going the way that we wanted it to. And so we pivot and we turn when what we're really called to do is sit and wrestle. We're called to struggle with the things that God has called us to. And and we ended last week talking about four verbs. I I want to recap that for us just a little bit because I believe it will help us. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Then we get to verse 8, and Paul says this, finally, emphatically pausing us, right, so that we'll pay attention. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Stop thinking about everything that's wrong. No, no, no. Look at the things that are right and noble and pure and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. Then he says this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the peace of God will be with you. These four verbs, learned, received, heard, and seen. We learn, we receive, we hear, and we see things in scripture that speak to our lives. These are your wrestling moves. These are the things that you go into the struggle and you go, okay, what have I learned? 
What have I heard? What have I received? And what have I seen? And you struggle with what have I learned? What have I heard? What have I received? And what have I seen? And when you do that over and over and you struggle and you wrestle and you put those moves into practice, into being, what happens is you'll reach a place where you'll be able to make decisions with peace. But you'll never receive the peace of God absent the struggle, absent the wrestling, absent the moves that you're putting into place. I love how God comes to Jacob in this moment because he doesn't come in the form of a dream or a vision. He spoke, he had spoken to Jacob in dreams before, but in this moment, he comes to him in a physical manifestation, which is what so many of us think would be much easier if God just came in physical manifestations to speak to us every time until you read the story of how Jacob had to wrestle till daybreak and then God put his hip out of socket for the rest of his life and you're like, ah, I think I'll just take the subtle hints in the word of God. Why does the way that God came to Jacob matter? Here's why. Because God's peace often comes in unexpected and even unwanted ways. How many of us really want to put the spiritual disciplines, our wrestling moves, what we've heard and learned and received and seen from the word of God into practice? Like, none of us just wake up every single morning like, you know what? I'm going to crack open that word of God. I'm going to receive some stuff. I'm going to learn some stuff. I'm going to hear some stuff. I'm going to receive some stuff. And I'm going to go put all those moves into place right now. I'm fired up about it. No, it's a dog fight to be in spiritual discipline. It's a dog fight to wake up every day and say, the plan of my life isn't going the way that I wanted it to, and I made some mistakes, and I had some shortcomings, but I'm going to get just a little bit better. I'm going to make one move in the right direction. I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to take the wrestling moves that Paul has given me, and I'm going to put them into place. I'm willing to struggle with God because his peace is valuable, and I know it comes in unexpected and even unwanted ways. I remember being in law school, and one of the most frustrating things about law school is it's one of those, you have to study in law school. Like, I don't care how smart you are, you have to study. There's no more of this like, yeah, hey, hey, well, I'll just show up and it'll all be okay. And so you're studying, and that first semester of law school literally makes zero sense. Like, no sense whatsoever. It's hard to describe because you literally sit there for all of these days, and then at the end of the semester, you take one test, and that's your entire grade. So you have no idea what your standing is up until that point. So you're trying to study. For, for many people in law school, it's the very first time they've ever had to struggle. They've ever had to study. They've ever had to put the time and the work in. And, and there's this nagging feeling that looms over your life when you're in law school because there's those handful of just, we call them gunners in law school. You know, those little turds that want to answer every question and study more than everybody and put in all the time and effort and work? Yeah, we don't like those people anywhere. Not at school, not at work, not at church, I don't care. <laughs> Calm yourself down. Need a whooping. So you see these people and you're like, man, what do I do? And so you, you begin to study and you're studying for weeks on end leading up to the end of the semester. And then for a couple of weeks, they call them dead weeks. And all you do is study for these tests that are coming. And you're studying and you're struggling and you're wrestling and none of it makes sense. And you're studying and you're struggling and you're wrestling and none of it makes sense. And you're studying and you're struggling and you're wrestling and none of it makes sense. And you're staying up all night long just trying to make a little bit of sense of all of this chaos that is around you. And, but the kicker is this, you want to give up. You want to give up after day one and week one and month one and then you're studying in that dead week and you want to quit, you want to stop because you're like, none of this makes sense. But as you struggle and you wrestle, all of a sudden, it's like the light switch comes on and all of it falls into place and all of it suddenly makes sense and all of a sudden you have a peace as you step into that classroom to take that test that's like i've done my part here's the beautiful thing about our god all he wants you to do is your part 
All he wants you to do is put in the practices, put in the struggle, put in the time, and be willing to grind on it until the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, comes over your life. That's what it felt like in law school. Now as a pastor, it feels like I wake up three, four nights a week for extended periods of time. It's actually longer. I got this really fancy ring. It like reads all this stuff about my life and I'm data driven and so I love all of this data. And I've had it for about a month now and it's telling me that the goal of my life is to manage my stress levels. (laughs) That was revolutionary, right? Got me. But it's telling me to manage my, my stress levels because of my restlessness at night. I, I don't sleep well. I, I, ne- I, I never have, but specifically over the last four and a half years, I don't sleep well at all. And, and it tells me how long I'm up at night and all these different things. And I drive my wife crazy because most nights I wake up at some point and I go upstairs to my office. Because what I have learned is that if I'll just get myself up and I'll go struggle with God for a little bit, I'll go wrestle with him, I'll go ask him what he has for me, I'll read the word of God, I write the vast majority of my sermon content between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m., all of a sudden I'll have a peace that transcends all understanding, and I'll go back to sleep and then the kids wake me up right when it gets good. (laughs) But it's the struggle. It's the wrestling match. It's putting into practice the things that the word of God actually tells us to do that allows us to receive the peace of God that comes from his holiness. In the passage it said this, when the man saw that he could not overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. If you're taking notes, write this down. It's important. An increase in faith in the gift of peace is greater than comfort or safety. God afflicted Jacob with a debilitating injury, one that follows him the rest of his life. Think about where Jacob is in his journey. He's waiting for his brother and 400 warriors to come whoop his tail. He's not in a peaceful moment in his life. He's not at the end of it with his feet kicked up where it doesn't really matter if he feels good. He's staring down the barrel of a fight, of a battle, of of something nasty coming his way. And God says, here's what I want you to understand. It is more important that you have my peace and the faith in me than it is for you to be comfortable or safe. But what do we very naturally seek as individuals? Comfort and safety. We want to be warm when it's cold and we want to be cool when it's hot and we want to be surrounded by all sorts of protection. I told you last week that God protects that which he speaks through. And we saw that evidence in the fact that the bush caught on fire but it wasn't consumed. Can I tell you that being on fire for God, putting into practice the wrestling moves and being engaged in the wrestling match will bring you to a place of discomfort that feels like you're very unsafe, but it's actually the safest place you could ever be. Because it's in the presence of God that you will find true peace that is everlasting. Man, God inflicts upon Jacob this debilitating injury. And we see in scripture that Jacob walked with a limp for the rest of his life. I'll put it to you like this. God changed Jacob's swag. I mean, Jacob, you know, like he, 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 he was second to be born, but baby, he was first when it all came out. You know what I'm saying? He tricked his brother, yeah, but he went off. He got him two wives, you know what I'm saying? One of them he really liked. The other one he was unsure about. It's in scripture. I didn't make that up. I imagine he had a certain swag to him, right? Felt like he had made it a little bit. Felt like he had overcome the obstacles that were in his way, the things that weren't really fair. God changed his swag. Can I tell you that when you have an encounter with God, he'll change your swag? He'll take your pride and he'll turn it to meekness? He'll take your arrogance and he'll turn it to humility? He'll take your doubts and he'll turn it into great faith. 
He'll take your weakness and he'll turn it into strength. Because after Jacob has an encounter with God in this moment and he receives this debilitating injury, he walked with the evidence that he had been in the presence of a holy God for the rest of his life. Scripture doesn't tell us this, so take this with a grain of salt, but I could imagine if you could sit down with Jacob today and you could ask him about this wrestling match, about this injury that he received, about walking with a limp, I imagine he would tell you that limp was the greatest thing he ever received. Because in that limp, he knew that he had been changed. And when he woke up on Monday morning after the wrestling match, after the frustration, after the struggle, and he began to walk with a limp, he was reminded that God had met him and that God had touched him. And on Tuesday, when everything wasn't going the way that he hoped that it would, and he was fighting with his wife and his kids weren't acting right, but he began to walk with a limp, he was reminded that God had touched him. There's joy in knowing that you have been in the presence of God, and it will change your swag. In verse 27, the man, God asked Jacob, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. I read it and I ask myself, why would God ask Jacob his name? He knows. God knows his name. He knew exactly who he was wrestling with. It wasn't out of ignorance that God asked this question. God's digging at the identity of Jacob. He's digging down deep and he's saying, I want an acknowledgement of who you are in this moment, of who you are in this wrestling match. God's making Jacob face his insecurity. He's making Jacob remember that, yeah, you've struggled and, yeah, you fought and, yeah, you always wanted to be first and, yeah, you deceived your brother so that you could actually be first. It's as if God's saying, I'm here to bless somebody, and I'm not going to bless the fake you. I'm only going to bless the real you. I want to get down in the deep of your life. I want to get down into all of it, into the crevices. See, we all have something that we struggle with, something that makes us feel weak, something that we feel like is our downfall, our shortcoming. But what I've learned in my life is that the thing that makes me feel weak and insecure, like my shortcoming, is very often the thing that God wants to use to be a blessing in my life. God, Jacob always wanted to be first. So he wrestled in the womb, and he wrestled coming out of the womb, and he deceived, and he plotted against his brother Esau, all so that he could be first. He tried to grab his brother's heel and pull him back in the womb and said, no, I, I'm coming first. He had a different relationship with his father that would have eaten at him and would have made him feel insecure. But in this wrestling match, God's pulling out of Jacob a greater identity. See, God changes Jacob's name from heel grabber to Israel, which means the one that strives with God. Here's what I want you to see. The tenacity that Jacob had to strive for first was the very same tenacity that gave Jacob the ability to strive with God. It was within the thing that made Jacob turn and churn and feel frustrated and weak that God pulled out and revealed to him, no, 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 it's the same Thing inside of you that has given you the ability to strive with me on this night, to wrestle with me and struggle with me, to hang on to me and to be in my presence. And I don't know what your thing inside of you is. Maybe you're tenacious, but you feel like you're not winning. Maybe you feel like you're a great employee, but you're not getting the raise that you feel like you deserve. Maybe you feel like you're very patient, but as a result of it, you're being ran over. Maybe you feel like you're extremely kind and giving, but as a result of it, you're being taken from. Maybe you feel like you're prayerful, you're a prayer warrior, but you're tired of 
all of the things being added to your prayer list, you're ready for some of them to be answered. Maybe you feel like you're an encourager, but you're always spoken to in a negative way. I don't know what it is for you that you struggle with, but can I tell you, the thing that makes you at times feel weak when given to God will be the very thing that he uses to bless you. But you have to give it to God so that he can use it for his kingdom. I love that he changed his name to Israel to strive with God because for so many of us, we strive with everything, we struggle with everything, we wrestle with everything but God. We strive at work, we strive at home, we strive in our marriages, we, 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 we strive as we race to church because we don't want to be late. We wrestle and we struggle with how we're going to get that house and how we're going to make that payment and how I'm going to have enough money in my 401k. We strive and we wrestle and we struggle with everything but God. He seems to be the last thing that we get to, the, 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 the last thing on the list. I'm so guilty. Here's how guilty of this I am. This message has been finished for a while. And on Friday, my oldest son Collier just has debilitating tooth pain. Just the, the ultra nasty, like he's tougher than boot leather. And I'm in the car with him and he's not even crying. There's just tears coming down his eyes. You know, the, the pain that makes you cry as his father because you think, man, how did I screw this up so bad? And so I'm Googling and I'm, I've read more about, I could be a dentist tomorrow. <laughs> I've read for hours on, on how to treat this toothpaste. I mean, everything from essential oils to crushed up aspirins to alternating pain relievers to aura gel to some crap you put on a cotton ball and stick in there to ice packs to hot packs to smoothies. To, I, I've done all of it that you could do. So all Friday, I'm fretting, and I'm anxious, and I'm frustrated, and I'm mad because dentists don't work on Fridays because something's wrong with them. And it hits me Friday night. I'm a pastor now and a father. You know what I haven't done? Just laid my hands on him and prayed for him. Just stopped. All of the striving and all of the struggling and all of the wrestling to just go and say, God, man, he's yours. He's not mine. You've just entrusted me to steward him for a little while on this earth. And as much as I care and as heartbroken as I am, I have no doubt that you care about him in even a greater way. That you care about him even more. And I'm just going to keep praying, and I'm just going to keep believing. And, and, and look, I don't even mean that in like a weird way. I didn't stay in my nine-year-old's room all night and make him feel uncomfortable. I prayed with him, and we believed together, and I left. And all Saturday, just, just I mean, literally, not ten minutes went by that I didn't just pray, just, just under my breath and in my mind and in my heart, like, God, man, I need you to move in this. I need you to move in this. And listen, it, it, nothing miraculous has happened. His tooth hasn't like all of a sudden healed and the swelling's gone. No, but he did sleep. And he's getting a little bit better. But here's what really happens. As his father, I can have peace. Why? Because I actually strived with the correct thing. I strived with God and not with man. And here's what happens. When you begin to strive with God, you'll have this ability to hang on to him just as Jacob did and say, I won't let go until you bless me. I won't let go until you bless me. God's saying, listen, Jacob, it's daybreak, bud. Let go of me. The wrestling match is over, okay? One, two, three, you're out. Your hips broke, bud. I don't know what to tell you. Jacob says, no, you don't understand me. I'm going to hang on to you until you bless me. I'll do whatever it takes to stay in this fight for as long as it takes because I know who I'm having an encounter with and I want to be blessed by you, a holy God that cares about me and loves me, that can change my identity, that can make me whole and new. Man. It's easy to say, yeah, 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 yeah. God's not showing up to change my name. Ah, it's 
where you missed it. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone, everybody say anyone. Come on, everybody say anyone is in Christ. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here's what I'm saying. If you came in this room struggling and striving and wrestling with all of the things of this world, all you have to do is begin to shift and put into practice the things that you've heard, that you've learned, that you've received, and that you've seen in the Word of God. That you, through Christ Jesus, are a new creation. That you, through the bloodshed of Jesus Christ, have been set free from the sin that feels like it binds you and has bound you to the things of this world. That you, through Christ Jesus, have been put in right standing with God Himself, the Creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that has no beginning and no end, the one that is holy who was, holy who is, and holy who has yet come to redeem His church from this lost and dying world. That you have a new identity found in Him. So you hold on and say, I'm not going to let go till you bless me. And we say that and we automatically think about stuff. Now see, the beauty of our God, the blessing, is found in relationship, not things. Because the relationship with God is not of this world. And you weren't made for this world. So stop counting your blessings as the things that you can acquire and start counting your blessings as the redeemed, as the ambassadors, as the new creation through Christ Jesus. Heavenly Father, man, we thank you for your word and your goodness and your truth. God, we thank you for your might. We thank you for your strength. We thank you for your peace. And God, I pray that we would go out of this place and that we would strive with and only with you. And that in doing so, we would receive your peace, which transcends all understanding. Let us just steal our hearts. Let us just get still in your presence. Not with fanfare, not with anything else, but just focused on you. Focused on your son, Jesus Christ, as we prepare to take communion. As we prepare to give you honor. As we prepare to worship you through these elements. The bread representing your body the juice representing your blood shed for each and every one of us, for anyone, no matter our yesterdays, no matter our present, you have something greater for our future. All across the house, if you want to pull back the miserable tabs of these hateful little cups. Maybe you're, maybe you're new to church. Can I just take 90 seconds and explain to you what we're doing so that you don't feel uncomfortable? And We're about to do something called taking communion. And 
as Jesus Christ was getting ready to leave this earth, he sat down with his closest disciples and he said, I want you to eat this bread. It's representative of my body broken for you. And I want you to drink of this wine, this, this juice, which represents my blood shed for you. And Paul goes on to remind the church that every time we do this, what we're doing is we're pausing to remember that Jesus Christ's body was broken for you and for me. And that his blood was shed so that we could be set free from our sins so that we could be that new creation. So maybe you came in, you're like, I don't even know how to strive with God. Can I tell you, this is one of the ways that you can strive with God. By just taking a moment to genuinely reflect on his goodness. Now sometimes you get asked the question, like who can take communion? Anyone that has professed that Jesus Christ is the savior of their life can partake of communion with us. You don't have to have like a special trick. There's not like a membership. There's not a class. There's not anything like this. This is just a community of believers coming together to pause and to put into practice to strive with God for just a moment by honoring him and his sacrifice as we're called to do in scripture. So before we do this, and because I want everybody in the house to be able to partake with us, I'm just going to simply say this. If you don't yet know Jesus, if you never professed him to be the savior of your life, we're going to say this prayer together, all of us, out loud. doesn't matter if we've known Jesus for 50 years or if we don't know him at all. We're all going to say this prayer out loud and proud and together. And even if it's your very first time to say it, after you say it, if you believe it, you profess it with your mouth and you believe it in your heart, then you can partake with us and know that this will be your very first communion. So let's all say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying for my sins. Today, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. And I declare that you are my Savior. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, let's all just lift the, the wafer, the bread up to heaven. Heavenly Father, man, I pray that you bless this. God, I pray that in our reflection of what you've done for us, we remember that you took 39 stripes. That your flesh was torn and that your bones were broken so that we could be set free. That you endured pain and punishment that was meant for us. But you took it upon yourself because you are holy. Because you love us. Because you care for us. And because you, Jesus Christ, wanted us to be in right standing with your Father, God himself. So we honor you as we take of this bread and we remember, we reflect, we strive, we wrestle, and we struggle with the fact that you would take our place. You may eat of the bread. We'll all take these cups and just hold them there. I'm just going to bless these. Heavenly Father, man, we thank you. We thank you for this juice that we're about to take that is representative of your blood shed for us and God the fact that the spotless one that the sinless one would come and that he would shed his blood so that we could all receive the covering of it is the most miraculous thing that this world has ever seen and will ever know and I pray that we would be a church that would allow this to become so deep down into our core, into our DNA, that we are saved by the bloodshed of Jesus Christ and faith in Him and by faith alone, that it would transform the way we look at the opportunity to be a part of your church, that it would transform the way we look at the opportunity to be your ambassadors, to be your servants, to be your hands and your feet and your voice on this earth, that we would transform it, that it would transform us into an army moving and marching and declaring your goodness for all of those that are around us to hear and to receive. God, we thank you for your bloodshed, the gift of salvation that you have given for us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. And everybody may drink of the juice.
hey, maybe you said the, the prayer of salvation for the very first time today. Can I tell you that if you did, I would love the opportunity to have a conversation with you because we don't wanna be a church that leaves you at salvation. We wanna be a church that journeys with you. We wanna be in relationship with you because here's what's going to happen. You said this prayer and you felt something in this room and you're gonna go home and you're gonna wake up tomorrow and you're gonna go, what's different? I thought he said I was a new creation. I'm so confused. I have the same struggles and the same bad desires and the same foul mouth and the same rotten friends and the same bad ideas. I thought I was a new creation. What happened? You're in a wrestling match. And Merge Church wants to be your tag team partner. We want to come alongside you, and when you get tired, you tag us in, and we'll come wrestle for a little while, and then we'll tag you back in, and you wrestle for a little while. So here's all you have to do. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. The green cards in the seat back in front of you, the same ones that you fill out if it's just your first time, happen to have one box at the bottom that no one can see, and if you'll check it and say, I gave my life to Christ today, what will happen is we'll reach out to you this week, and just open ourselves up to a conversation. Maybe you don't want to have one. That's okay. We won't be pushy. We won't press on you. But we just want to be available to you to answer questions that you may have to see what we could do for you to partner alongside, to wrestle alongside, to be in the match with you. So grab that card. Fill it out. Everyone's just going to think it's your first time. Check that box. Drop it in the generosity boxes right outside here, and we'll reach out to you this week. Everybody stand up all across this place. Everybody say this with me out loud and proud and together. I am in a wrestling match. I love you guys with all of my heart. Have a great